There we go. Now I see us. Good morning, everyone. All right, we are live. I'm not frozen. We can see your guys' faces and we are ready to rock and roll. All right, so uh, today was a great morning, have amazing options and uh, put it up to a vote. And by put it up to a vote, that means I asked Stephanie which one she, she would want to listen to. And so this morning, uh, we're going to be diving into some more amazing mindset conversations. And the big part of this one is uh, why on mindset? Why do we want to do all this stuff? And, and the reason why is because this business and your business is almost like 80% mindset. You know, you're doing stuff, you're doing stuff, you're doing stuff. And then all of a sudden something bad happens and you get knocked down. Well, it's the mindset that you have that allows you to get back up and go again. So why do we do a lot of things based on mindset is because we know that once your mind is right and once it's fortified, you're unstoppable. So today we're going to be jumping into an amazing Ed Milet video. Uh, as you know, we did one of these interviews with John Maxwell and Caroline Leaf, and now Caroline Leaf is being interviewed by Ed Milet. So this is going to be uh, chock full of notes. So uh, grab your uh, iPad pencil sharpener and uh, get ready to go. Hi, welcome back to Max Out, everybody. I'm so excited to have this guest here today. By the way, she's made a huge sacrifice. She's what at the time of recording this, there's a storm where she lives in Texas. Snow's rolled in. There's no power. She went and got a hotel room so that we could do this today. <clears throat> so if you see the background, that's where she is. And uh, you wouldn't know it from the background, but this is one of the most remarkable people I've ever talked to in my life. I had the great honor of being on her show. She's a cognitive neuroscientist, which just even saying those things is a miracle that I can get that out of my mouth. Never mind. Understand what it is. Um, she's one of the most brilliant people you're ever going to meet in your life. She's a best-selling author. She's got a PhD in communication pathology. She's brilliant. And you're going to write a bunch of notes today. I mean, like a bunch of notes. So Dr. Caroline Leaf, thank you for being here and making the sacrifice to be here today. Oh, Ed, I wouldn't have missed this. So thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And, and I just absolutely love talking to you. We had the most amazing yeah. talk on when you, when I interviewed you. And I think you're incredible as well. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't hold a candle to you what we're going to talk about today, that's for sure. And we're going to talk a lot about your brain today. Um, she's an expert on memory. She's an expert on thinking. Um, she's also a woman of faith. She's a very complex, interesting person and, uh, <laughs> and, and a pleasure to listen to, as you can already hear with that South African accent. So let's start out a little bit because we're going to talk about thinking. So I was thinking about thinking Good. when I was preparing to talk with you. And I think it'd be a good place to start because I don't think most people understand it. What is a thought? Like, oh, how, how does a thought work? That is such a great question. And, and I'm really glad that you asked that because it's a good place to start. Okay, a thought is something that you actually build. It, it, so it's the consequence of three actions. And those actions are thinking, and when you think, you always you feel, and when you think and feel, you choose. Those three, like my fingers are like stuck together, those three always go together. You're always thinking, when you're thinking, you're always feeling, when you're thinking and feeling, you're always choosing. And that is mind, and when mind happens, which always happens, you never, your mind is never not with you. You wake up with your mind, you go to bed with your mind, you get dressed with your mind, you eat with your mind, you have discussions with your mind, they're using your mind now, your mind never stops. So you're always thinking, feeling and choosing and thinking and feeling and choosing has a consequence and the consequence is a thought. So the thought is the result of thinking, feeling and choosing. So during the course of the day, you think, feel and choose in response to the experiences of life. It begins as you open your eyes in the morning and at night time, when you close your eyes and go to sleep, then the, the thing, the building part of thinking, feeling and choosing building, you think you'll choose and build thoughts all day long. And then at night time, your mind is still going, but now you're sorting out the thoughts that you've built, kind of a housekeeping, regenerative function, why we dream, get prepared for the next day and all that kind of stuff. Hmm. So thought is a real thing that is holding the data of the experience. And it holds the data in terms of information 
and emotions because you think and feel and choose. So it's data and emotions. So a simple way to understand this is all the listeners and viewers now, as you introduced me, you would have like literally sown a seed in the ground to use that analogy of this is some kind of thing about thinking and mind and brain and whatever. And then as we speaking, we are growing little roots. So as, as, as I'm speaking, they're growing roots. Those roots are protein structures and they are holding my words as vibrations and as i'm giving more information so you are growing more of these little protein branches in your brain and it's all connected and coordinated and you're doing it in your own unique way so every listener would be building their own roots and it's it's filled with data and emotions because you're thinking and feeling and choosing as you're listening to me and then you grow like a little tree trunk which is your angle how you view this information and then that produces little branches with leaves and i've got some analogies here here's a, here's a thought that's what a thought looks like the roots you yeah. can't see but there's the little tree trunk and there's the branches with the leaves and the branches with the leaves are the memories of how you are seeing this information so it's the behaviors and the motions of how you see this information so my words are down here in the roots and yes. your interpretation are in the branches and the leaves and so that whole thing is a thought and like a tree is made of branches and roots so a thought is made of root memories and branch memories and collectively this then produces what you say and what you do it produces your actions so everything that you do all your communication your writing speaking talking running dancing jumping relationship work all of that stuff is coming from thoughts that we've built and we're doing this all day long. We're building thoughts. And then at night, we sort the thoughts out. And that's a healthy thought for the viewers and those that can't see it is some just on audio. This is a toxic tree, a toxic thought. So I'm using a, a wiry thought, also yeah. a tree, but you can see it's very much the living dead game of throwing stuff. <laughs> so yes. it's very much alive, but there's the roots, the trunk and the, and the trees in your brain. Your tr thoughts look like trees. That's why we say that thoughts have an arbor like structure, tree like structure. Yeah. And in, um, and this is healthy. Our brain is wired for, for this. It's not wired for this. This is a good, a nice folded protein, nice balanced chemicals, all the right stuff. And this is un incorrectly folded proteins and chemicals and creates a massive response in our immune system in the brain, which thinks that this is something like COVID. It doesn't like, um, this at all. So the immune system will send out the same kind of um, immune army, the B, B, B and T lymphocytes and macrophages and all that kind of thing to fight this toxic thought in the same way it will fight COVID or any virus in your body. So that's how real they are. Wow. Okay. So let's <laughs> unpack that a little bit. So first, think, feel, choose is something everybody can take from this right now and understand that you're processing information that way. This idea okay. of the root with the tree is brilliant. I, even, I understand that. So I'm still with you. You got and, it. Um, but, you know, when you and I have talked in the past, I want to ask you about this. So it sounds to me as if past experience, past thought informs future thought. Absolutely. If we're, not, if we're not conscious of it. So let's assume I have a pattern of responding to stimulus in a particular way because of this roots gotten bigger and bigger and the trees gotten bigger and bigger. And so these past experiences, these past thoughts are informing how I think, feel and choose currently. How does one overcome the negative implications potentially if they're toxic thoughts uh, of not doing detrimental damage to us now? Excellent question as well. So they, they, you're totally correct. Uh, every experience we have is basically built into our brain and into our mind. So already the implication of what I'm saying is that mind and brain are not the same thing. So we can go there in a moment, but to, to, to answer your question, we have to be, uh, we, we, and when I say we, we with our thinking, feeling, choosing. So we, you, me, that's mind. So we've got this part of our mind that's just what I like to call the wise mind. It's this instinct that we just know. It's, it, for example, it's like when you someone comes to you for advice and you just give them the, this great advice and there's just this, wow, I didn't even know I knew that. Or you have a great conversation or something like that. There's this, this instinct inside of us of what's right. Okay. And that's what I call the wise mind. And that's thinking, feeling, choosing. So we've got this at our core. And so we're drawing on that, that, that sort of that wise mind psychologically is a gravitational field scientifically and that we use to then self-regulate the stuff that's driving us crazy or the bad habits we've got or the whatever so mm. we have to get into a system of mind management we need to manage our minds through self-regulation and we see from neuroscience and from mind brain integration research which has been my field for nearly 40 years now that we can do that every 10 seconds 
I'm not asking you to check on your watch, like on your Apple watch for every 10 seconds or your timer. I'm just saying, basically, we be supposed to be when you're conscious, you should always be self regulating to the extent where like, for example, now we're talking. So whoever's listening, whoever's watching, just look at your hands, look at your facial expression, look, be aware of your body movements, be aware of the impact of what you're saying and how you're saying it or how you're listening. I'm, look, I'm watching all of that at the moment while I'm speaking. I'm extremely aware of it because I'm saying it. I'm looking at your face. I'm seeing your responses. So that self-regulation is what we should be doing all the time. When you self-regulate yourself like that, you'll self-regulate how you're thinking, feeling, and choosing in response to every experience, the conversation, the things that irritate you, the things that frustrate you, the mm. patterns in your life. You'll start seeing, oh, I always respond in this way yes. when this kind of thing happens, or my husband or wife or business partner or child or whatever. We always seem to have the same kind of argument. There's a pattern. So you can start identifying the toxic patterns when you self-regulate. So and then you can start identifying the repetition, and then you can start thinking, observing, for example, that maybe you highly anxious five times a day or almost every day or all. So you start seeing these patterns in your life and all yes. those patterns, that's self-regulation. Caroline's so brilliant that I want to unpack. She, she can say eight incredibly powerful things and I don't want to, I don't want to go over all of them and go to the next thing because I want to go deeper on them. So um, you talk about the difference between the mind and the brain. I'd like to yes. just have you just mention that. And then you teach like, I think you call it like five steps to mind management. Yes, the neuroscience. And, and so give us a quick, what's the difference between brain and mind? And what are these five steps to managing our mind? Okay. Maybe you just listed a few of them there, but I, I like lists. So I'm just wondering what those Absolutely. are. Absolutely. Well, first of all, the five steps we, we call the neuroscience, well, I call it the neurocycle. So with your mind, you're cycling through your brain. You, you're directing the neuroplasticity, which is really nice to know. You can actually direct changes in your brain. So my whole premise is that if you are always, your mind is always working and it's always changing the brain and it's always happening, can we direct that process? So for three, 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 almost four decades now, I've been researching that. And the answer is yes. And that's what's in the book, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. So if you add the nearest cycle to your lifestyle, and it's a lifestyle, you actually will literally improve your ability to manage your mind by 81% and more, which is phenomenal because it means that you influence cellular health through the telomeres, which we can unpack as well. Um, you can reduce inflammation, you can improve your immune function, your cardiovascular function, neurological kidney, like everything about your body will respond to mind management because your mind basically is driving all those functions anyway. Your gut health, your gut brain interaction, all of it isn't happening if you did, your brain and body are dead. So what keeping what's the difference between a dead person and an alive person mind so if mind is messy brain and body are messy if mind is cleaned up and it's a process because we're all going to be messy because we have free will and part of getting a, a, a mind sorted out man part of mind management is dealing with the mental mess it's accepting i'm going to be make bad decisions i'm going to get into arguments i am going to make you know misunderstand people i am going to have acute traumas and toxic traumas and imposter syndrome and people pleasing and all the stuff all of us go through in different ways. So I'm going to have that and it's okay, but how am I going to manage it? Yeah. So for me personally, what's happened over the years is that I still go through these things, but the difference is I'm 81% more efficient in identifying and managing. So instead of something that could throw me years ago for days and affect my work and everything, I can deal with it within seconds and minutes and get back on track. So that's one part of the answer. So before I go to mind brain, do you want to ask anything or unpack anything with what I know I are there are there specifically five things like it are going a sequence yes it's a sequence so so before I tell the sequence let me tell you mind brain because it'll make so much more sense okay. because I've said alluded to it a lot so your mind is separate from your brain but inseparable so the what is the brain the brain and mind are not the same thing um, and the, the brain and body collectively are made of 37 to 100 trillion cells and your mind is and, and then that those 37 to 100 trillion cells arrange themselves into this incredible the brain and, and the heart and the lungs etc and your mind is what actually is the external force that keeps them going the blood flowing the chemicals electricity the electromagnetics all of that which is phenomenal so that's why if our mind's not managed 
the body and the brain will be a mess. Mm. And so, and that goes down to even like if you are eating, if you're eating, maybe eating a farm to table, wonderful diet, etc. but you're not dealing with your anxiety or you're not, you're just trying to stuff it down or you're not dealing with that bad habit or that toxic trauma, you will lose up to 80% of the nutrition because wow. your mind has affected the ability of the digestive system to actually digest and get the assimilate the nutrients and sometimes it's kind of messy and sometimes it's great and we all if we're human we are going to experience messes and there's no shame in that the sooner we get rid of the shame and guilt and condemnation around being messy and the sooner we as leaders talk about the mind more authentically the more the more we give people that follow us a permission to talk about mind. Only 3% of leaders are talking about mind, which is terrible. Mm. So that doesn't, that's creating the stigma that they're pretending that we're perfect. And that's why we see people that seem to be perfect in their lives and they're committing suicide. Meanwhile, it's because we've got this philosophy in this day and age of not being open and seeing um, issues of the mind as helpful messengers of an underlying issue. The neurocycle then is these five step. It is how you manage your mind moment by moment. So it's a lifestyle. So the neurocycle is what you do when you're awake and, and conscious, and it then automatically prepares you for sleep because sleep is fixing up your brain. So your mind is always with you. So your mind always needs to be managed. And so an analogy, and then I'll dive into the five steps. You can go three weeks without food. You can go three days without water. You can go three minutes without oxygen, but you don't even go three seconds without using your mind. So you're always thinking, feeling, and choosing. Yeah. So it's gather awareness. Second step is to reflect. Third step is to write. Fourth step is to recheck. And the fifth step is an act of reach. So each of those, they're so profound. They do the most phenomenal stuff in your brain. And the first half of the book where I talk about the mental health system and I talk about my clinical trials, I do explain what each of those steps are doing. So the first thing is to gather awareness. Gather awareness, and I've chosen words very carefully. If you think of a big fat apple tree and you're apple picking, and this apple tree is so full that you actually can't, like you just go up to and you just nudge it and this apples are just falling on your head. That's how we often feel when we, our minds are mess. It's just, everything's just falling on our head and it's just too much. So what you can do with a neurocycle is when you feel that situation coming on, remove yourself from the tree and stand back and watch the tree yes. and gather awareness of all of that. Don't be scared of it. Don't run away from the apple tree. Yeah. Just stand back and observe the apple tree. Observe what's going on there. Let me jump in about that. This is brilliant. <laughs> One of the things I've taught for a long time, I didn't understand the neuroscience behind it was that for me, and there's four other steps. This is why everybody needs to get the book, but awareness of your thoughts. I've always said when I'm aware of these patterns, when I'm aware of my thoughts, they begin to lose their power over me their influence over me. And one of the reasons that, that you're, you're explaining it scientifically, which I've always wanted to understand better because I do become separate from the thought when I observe it, almost like I'm above it and distant from it, like you said. And I realize I'm not just that thought and that it is a pattern that I'm running. And so I just want to acknowledge what Caroline's saying because from a practical standpoint, when I coach people, this is something that is the first thing I teach is just becoming aware. Now to know that there's four other steps is obviously very empowering as well, but and I want to just unpack this a little bit into another area. So I want to use your brilliance towards something else. One thing I it's want to acknowledge is that what Caroline is saying is that neuroplasticity is real, that mind can change matter, that literally that these thoughts, if you change them, change the protein structures in your brain, change the matter of your brain. So this is powerful to know that we can physically change our brain by using our mind. And this distinction between the mind and the brain is also a breakthrough way of listening to it or seeing it for me, as I'm sure it is for everybody else. Just those things alone, just those two things alone have made our time already incredibly invaluable for me and anybody listening to it. But as in terms of patterns and awareness and the power that these patterns can have over us, I'm a big believer that identity drives so much of our lives. Mm, and mm. you being, I'm just, I've heard you talk about this briefly, but you know, I think we all are trying to become consistent with whatever this identity is that we think mm -hmm. we hold for ourselves. And sometimes the lack of an identity is, is unbelievably detrimental to someone's yeah. life. And I've heard you talk about this being from South Africa and watching what they tried to do with Mandela. Mm -hmm. And, and so could you speak for a minute about the power that identity has over us and a little bit of how we can 
at least be more aware of the identity we hold and how we can change it to serve us if we need to. Love your question. That's brilliant. And it's so important. Um, yes, I grew up, I was born in Zimbabwe and that had enough, that country alone had enough problems and still has, and then grew up in South Africa and all my kids were born there. And we've been in the States now for 13 years. So I was in South Africa in the apartheid era and the transition and the post. And so by the time I was, had my first child, my second child that Mandela came into power, we actually, I was carrying my a newborn baby and in the to go vote for Mandela literally and with our with our housekeeper and you know th that's how significant that is in my in my lifetime but I was working in the pre-apartheid if the pre-transition in the I mean the, the the apartheid era and it was horrific I I chose to I worked across all socioeconomic strata and different political areas so from the riches of the rich to the poorest of the poor education corporate and I spent three days a week working in the what they called the townships, which were areas that they had two apartheid separated out, absolutely evil. And the reason I chose to, to work in all the different environments was to understand mind and humanity. So wherever you are, whatever you're in, how does this work and how can we how can we use our mind to help us cope with all these different circumstances? So in terms of identity, absolutely what you experience. Um, in your nurturing and in your and in the environment that you grow up in is definitely going to affect how you see yourself because every experience is a is converted through think feel yeah. choose into brain yeah. so you can imagine a massive forest which is your yeah. non-conscious mind n o n and that massive forest is filled with all different shapes and sizes of trees and in between the green trees you've got these little black trees and maybe there's a big clump and maybe there's a little one and some trees are little and some green little black trees from a recent experience and some very big ones from some long established experience. So something like racism would be a very, very dominant cluster of dark black trees mm -hmm. oozing the warning signal of all the anxiety and the stress and the terrible things that come from something as evil as racism, which is pervasive mm -hmm. and affecting ability to actually how you see yourself. And so every bit of nurturing is built into your brain. Every experience is built into your brain. So this forest is influencing in the middle of the forest, just to give a visual, we have this wide full of optimism bias. So I always explain it like a strip of trees that are perfect. So in the middle of the forest, there's this untouched area that's just perfect. And that's where we want, we want to really access that. So if you're flying your helicopter, which is you in life, you're flying your helicopter and you kind of, if you, as you develop self-regulation, you don't just fly your helicopter and bash into a tree and crash, which is what you, we do a lot of. That's messy. We, we, want, to, we want to know how to not do that. So self-regulation teaches us how to fly with a pilot and co-pilot. So we're flying over this forest and we're looking at where whatever, the, whatever smoke signals are coming up, where, where the signals. And if you see there that there's so much of that particular type of black cluster of trees, dark, and that's influencing how you see yourself, your identity has been affected. But if you look at your, if you really dig deep and you, you'll see the middle part of the forest, which is you, it's Ed, who can do something else that no one else can do. But there's these traumatic experiences that are affecting identity. So they can block and they can become so big that they can actually build a, like a black wall against the green forest. So it's almost hard to see who you really are because you're so busy um, being involved in that, that you, you're stuck in that cluster. So that's why I say you've got self-regulation is not sitting and walking amongst those trees and getting lost, which is what we do, but it is actually getting in the helicopter and flying above and saying, okay, self-regulate. What am I doing? What am, what's, what, why? And, and you, and the only way you can get to the trees and the forest and all that stuff is by looking at the warning signals. So these we track. And then, so then you would pay attention, gather awareness of four basic signals. The first is the emotional. So let's say that you're feeling a high state of anxiety that could be or depression. Now, depression and anxiety are not it's, they're not illnesses. To say you have clinical depression or clinical anxiety is one of the most unscientific statements of our age and has created a huge problem where people are now way, batting way more with mental health, not because mental health is on the rise, but because the mismanagement of mental health is on the rise. We're not allowing people to talk about the story in the forest. We're just saying, oh, signal of depression, five symptoms, you can't sleep, you can't get out of bed, you're feeling um, whatever, suicidal, whatever, okay. Diagnosis, label, treatment is mainly medication at the current stage is the gold standard. Some therapy if you're lucky. Okay. And that very often the therapy is putting a band-aid on the wound because they don't deal with the whole origin story. Wow. That's terrible. What we have to do is we have to say, okay, so there is the signal. 
there is this emotion of depression it's consistent in your life or anxiety or both very often it's comorbid together and terror and despair and anger and a whole bunch of others it's never just one so all of this is giving you power and giving you control shifting the power balance when you do this gather in this way and i'll finish the other three in a moment you are making 1400 neurophysiological responses work for you and not against you your blood vessels around your heart are dilating, which is sending blood flow and oxygen to your brain. That's increasing your ability to think more, more creatively. It's decreasing impulsivity. I can go on and on and on. So then I now my body is in a state of healing. But when I suppress it, if I don't gather awareness, if I just suppress it, my 1400 neurophysiological responses will work against me. So now my blood vessels around my heart, for example, one of the 1400 will constrict. That means less blood flow, less oxygen to the brain, increased impulsivity, decreased cognitive flexibility. That's just a few. There's a, a, a lot more that I'm just giving a few not to overwhelm. So I, I, I stay in a state of increased vulnerability to disease by 75 to 98 percent if I don't gather awareness. But if I gather awareness, I shift that. The moment I gather awareness, in milliseconds, I've gone from brain damage to brain healing. In yeah. seconds. Wow. In milliseconds. That's phenomenal. This is how important mind management is. Yeah. So then I gather, and this is not hard. It is hard, but it's not hard. It's hard because we, we have got very... We just want to, we want quick fixes. There's no quick fix when right. it comes to mind. This is a lifestyle. So you gather awareness of your emotional stuff, the depression, anxiety, label it, be specific. Um, then you're going to gather awareness of your physical state, heart fluttering, GI symptoms, tension in your shoulders. What is physically going on alongside this em emotional stuff? It could be a series of things. There's no, there's no cookie cutter, anything. You're unique. You, you have a unique signal guide. Then you're going to look at your behavioral signals. In other words, what are you doing? How are you speaking? How are you How are you connecting with others? How are you doing your work? How are you just with yourself and all the behaviors? How are you speaking? How are you, whatever? What's your creativity like? So what are your behaviors when you're in this state? And then you're going to go to your perspective. As I start getting specific about looking at these emotional, physical, and behavioral warning signals, I'm actually looking at the branches. I'm looking at this, these, because they have memories. The mm. thought tree is made of memories. So I'm, the signals have drawn me in and those have been these, what I've just described. But now as I land my tree, I'm starting to look a little closer at these signals. Mm. And so now I also want to look at what my perspective is. What is the tree trunk? What's the perspective of, what's this giving me? Life sucks or I hate life or yeah. it's not worth living or there's just no purpose or What's the, and then you start that. So by the time you've done that, you've objectively gathered all these apples in your basket. You control them. Now you go to looking at the detail. What is, does this mean? What's the data? That's when you reflect. So reflect is ask, answer, discuss, ask, answer, discuss, put the thoughts on trial, do that autopsy, that mental brain surgery without the blood. Why? And then you answer why? And you discuss why? And you dig, dig, dig. Anyway, so when you write, you can write in lines, but I would recommend you learn how to make a metacog. It is unbelievable. In therapy, when I used to still practice, we would have people battling with schizophrenia, which is not a disease. It is a broken mind. It is someone who's gone through so much trauma that they're disassociating their minds, disassociated. It's a symptom of an underlying trauma. And very often they can get multiple personalities because it's coping. It's pure survival. So the system of the neurocycle in the extreme form, we would use that. And by the time we got to writing, I could show, I could have a subject who had split their personality, their minds because of trauma as they're writing onto the medic in the medical which is a pattern in the med middle on branches like a tree like a branch grows each branch grows out the previous branch and leaves are growing on the branches that's what you do you grow branches and you put your words on the branches and you, you just like literally pour your brain on paper as we did this we would the the sub patients would actually see oh same con they're talking about the same thing but suddenly there's three different perspectives the fourth step is then to recheck it's to look at what you've written the third step's messy it's like words all over the place the fourth step is where you start connecting what are the patterns what is the antidote what is the what do i need to reconceptualize see it differently it's if we use an algebraic example we all probably remember X plus Y equals Z, even if we didn't understand it. I'm sure all of us can recall X plus Y equals Z. And the concept there is that X plus Y creates something kind of new that's over, it's like sort yeah. of replaces. I'm not saying that, I'm saying X plus Y equals XY. Reconceptualization is XY. Wow. Because it's your story that you don't want to just, Z, I'm putting a Band-Aid on. I'm not fixing the issue. And that's what, if you just, if you just do like 10 CBT, 
you know, cognitive behavior therapy, not that I'm saying it's bad, you can use CBT, but CBT fits in step five, if you want it to work for you, you've got to first find out what's going on. And then you, but if you just, or positive affirmations, people use, uh, they're feeling terrible, or they want to achieve a goal, 10 of those in the morning, 10 at night, they, it's a band-aid. It's not going to be sustainable because you have to find out what you what are you trying to drown with the affirmation. So you want the affirmation to work. You have to go through the neurocycle, then the affirmation will work as a first step. You know, that's how you've got to change perspective. There's so much in there to unpack that I don't, I want everybody to do is go back and replay that because there's so much in there. And then also you have to have the book too, so that some of these things that, you know, that are on the surface while we're doing this now go much when you're in the book. But I want to ask you, we're getting so deep into the science of it. One of the things that I'm going to go a completely different direction with you. For oh, a minute. So one of the things that fascinates me about you is that as I've learned more is you're also a person of faith, not religion, so to speak, I don't think, yeah. but faith. Mm -hmm. And um, frankly, most of my uh, scientist friends, even my science friends, not all of them, so this isn't a fair statement, but yeah. I think you would agree with me that by yeah. and large, there's usually two camps of people in life. Absolutely. There's sort of faith-based and science-based. And that's not, that's that's too big of a general statement. But because it's true. I have, right, it's by and large, I have all kinds of friends who are very scientifically based, including myself, yeah. who have incredibly faith. But you are a little bit, that you understand so much about the brain. And I'm wondering for you, uh, I've always felt like my thoughts are prayers. I've felt that Love way. That. That thoughts, That's beautiful. Thoughts are prayers. Is there any validity to that being true? Because prayer is such a deep state of consciousness. And, diet. and then is there anything particularly about maybe organized religion in general you think maybe gets it wrong? So it's kind of two questions mm, in one. Mm. And I'm just curious of your thoughts about both of them. Because I mm. just personally, I'm fascinated by that both you live in both worlds as do i so i'm just curious i love it i love how you i love that you've asked that question and for me it's the, the most obvious answer because spirituality and science are one and the same thing so if you think of like all the what? beautiful okay. all the they're just two sides of the same coin but if you think of it like the spirituality is like a story the philosophy and if you look at all like the bible and, and the torah and the quran you all the holy books of all the different religions whichever religion and the, just the diversity of all the religions is an indication of how magnificently huge humanity is and that there's something that's beyond that's how i see it so the different diversities is so beautiful and how all across the whole world every culture has some belief system that goes beyond just me here and that's that for me is spirituality and i don't and and that's where it goes to even the second answer first is that i think organized religion is just man trying to get control but when and if they want to do it and it keeps them being a loving person great and if they are an accepting person of other religions fantastic the problem of organized religion comes in when they say this is the only way because there's no ways that there is only one way because there's so many different people there's something you can do that no one else on this planet can do so if it doesn't do it we all suffer so there's a viewpoint and every the beauty of the diversity is different ways of seeing the different facets of what i would call godness so i talk about godness as opposed to god and limiting god to how so many religions will say he i never understand he even in the bible it says male god made in god's image male and female so obviously god's not male or female gods a combination of what we don't understand so the beauty of spirituality is we just don't understand it and to try and understand it is to lose to miss it and to see that it's this incredibly beautiful beyond the sunset the falling in love the having a child the the, the rising from the ashes the you know the the ex agreeing to disagree seeing different ways of doing different things seeing that that is not just one type of that is spirituality and that's the story it's the beautiful story of humanity science is how it all works how does the world work how does the brain work how does the mind work how do we as humans work and how does the world work so you can't separate them because you are a human and if you believe in 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 whatever you believe in you, you still are a human with a brain. So science still applies to you because you're a human. You use your cell phone. You're using science. You eat food. You, you That's science. You are parenting a child or you are running a business. That's science. Science comes from the word sclera, which means knowledge. So everything that we gain, everything, you're a scientist. I'm a scientist. We just science and we just both have knowledge of different fields. You know, so if you look at it like that, it's about knowledge 
the how to, and then the story of, and you put the two together, you have a beautiful, complex humanity. The so reason I wanted to ask Caroline, this guy's going to jump in is because she said this on stage with one of the most powerful and well-known pastors in the world in a conversation that I watched. And I know, you know, the conversation I'm talking yes. about Caroline and, and uh, he responded like I did because I'm a Christian and that's an organized religion. When I yes. say organized religion, I don't mean it in the way that most people do. I mean more like the doctrine particular yes. church as opposed to an organized doctrine of a religion. I, I believe in Jesus Christ. People know that that follow me, yeah. but I'm open and uh, love people of all faiths, but I believe in an organized religion, but oftentimes, you know, certain specific churches will, yes. you know, um, certain scriptures to an extreme. One of the things that she was talking about with one of the, with this particular pastor was, and he even said that sometimes, you know, the bad things that happen in our life, it's very easy if you just blame it on the devil or blame it on exactly. this, but what if it, what if it wasn't just the devil it happened to be that you're thinking in a toxic way? And so there is this, and I want to bridge that yeah. gap between people that are strong believers and, yeah. and science. Like I believe there's a quantum field. I just happen to believe the Absolutely. creator of the universe created this larger field that we can plug into that has vibrational frequency. Exactly, exactly. And things. And, and so I'm, I want to make sure my audience knows I'm a strong believer in my faith at the same yes. time. And I'm a strong believer in the organized structure of Christianity for me. But yeah. what I... What I think sometimes, I think you do too, sometimes though, particular churches, every church anybody's ever gone to, no matter what their faith is, there's a slant. There's a, a reliance on maybe one version of mm -hmm. scripture or a belief than other. And I make sure that sometimes that doesn't blunt people understanding that they have thoughts. They still control it specifically. They can still gain, to your point, science, more knowledge. I do the program. For me, the more I learn, about the nuances and the sophistication, the intricacies of the brain and neuroscience yep. makes me more reliant that there must be a creator of this magnificent structure. Exactly. We, we exactly. have a very, mm -hmm. a very basic understanding of. And so when you're hearing scientific things like this, for me, it strengthens my face. What an amazing God I must have to create these amazing beings that we all are that function the way we are. And I think that God wants us to function at a higher level for his good, for the service of you. And the more we understand ourselves, the more we understand our mind and the difference in our mind, our thought, the trees, and the, all of the stuff that we're talking about here, feel, the more you become great at these things, you can serve your God better, it, it, your version of God. So I just want to make sure Thank I you. said that today because it's, you see, so fascinating to me in this regard. Okay, a couple more things because we're going to run out of time and like, I love this stuff. Is there one or two? Can I can I interrupt you for one second? Sorry, I want to just yes, try to yes. add to that there. If you think of yes. the, um, the, I mean, I was just teaching in a church this last Sunday. I teach all over the place: neuroscience conferences, churches, medical communities. I, I, I teach humanity. Yes. I teach humanity. Yes. And one of the things, what do we think we're doing here? We're capturing, we're bringing all thoughts into captivity. We're renewing yes. the mind. So that if you want to know the science of how to do that, you know, the, that, that's a, that's a, the statement that people will make. Oh, bring all thoughts, but they're not doing it. So here I'm telling you how to do it. So that's where the Bible tells the story. Science is how to do it. Yes. And then you, and we dawn, when we talk about wired for love and survival and that forest through the middle, that's our made in love image, which is perfection. But we have, I lay before you life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. So we can choose. So that's why we make a mess in the outer forest. And that's why we have to go into our wisdom forest to go fix up the outer forest. So there's kind of a, if you want a more spiritual angle to what I teach. No, I love that. And I want people <laughs> to know that you do as well. And this really strong belief. I don't like this battle between the two, which to me is just ridiculous. Like yeah. this beautiful brain that Caroline has tapped into that is her to serve us, to serve one another so that we can live longer and so that we can live more productively and we can be kinder to one another and we can understand ourselves. And the more and more I've understood how my mind works and I've changed myself through lots of techniques like she teaches, I frankly feel like I've been you know, I sin all the time still, but I, but I feel like I'm a better man of God. I understand human beings better. I have more empathy, I have more faith because I understand these things. And so they're not one or the other, they're both, as you've said. Two sides but of I, the same coin. Can you give us one or two 
to brain rituals for brain health, just rituals for brain health. One or two things to do on a regular basis. Okay. Well, the neurocycle goes without saying that's your number one. We yeah, need to, huge. we need to get into that's the main, that is the main thing that you want to be doing all the time because that's constantly driving your mind and driving neuroplasticity. So you're linking into the spiritual and you're driving that healthy spiritual through the brain to get the brain healing like it should. So that brings brain healing. And so that in addition to that, you can do your brain preparation and brain preparation would include things like deep breathing and these different types of breathing. So one of the techniques that um, that I've kind of combined and researched, which is so powerful, is um, is this combination where you would breathe in for three counts, but, okay. uh, but then you breathe out for seven. So it's a 10 second, I call it the 10 second pause. So you're breathing in for three, a deep inhalation, but you're exhaling for seven. And the reason you exhale for longer and you really whoosh it out, you really push it out like that yogi breath, you really push it out that ocean breath at the back of your throat, is that that pushes the oxygen to the front of your brain. And the minute you upload oxygen, oxygen to the front of your brain, but you almost like have to shake your head because you feel lightheaded. You have increased your, um, you've dropped impulsiveness and you've increased your introspective ability. So you're wiser, you've increased your wisdom and you've also calmed down your chemicals that will then calm down your entire brain and body, which then makes you much more able to think clearly. So if you do that at least six to nine times, so for 60 to 90 seconds, you are going to put your brain health in a very ideal state to do the neurocycle. But at any stage, if you need to calm down in the moment, that's a great 60 to 90 second thing. So in for three, out for seven. And then you can add to make it even more powerful. You can add a cognitive component. You can take the words of the mind. Remember, mind is how you think, how you feel, and how you choose. The three work together. So you can add, You can you, when you breathe in, when you inhale for three, you say think, feel. And then as you exhale, you say choose. So it's Ooh. think, feel, choose. And as you do that, you can do it quietly in your mind or out loud. You are bringing in a cognitive component factor. So you're forcing mind-brain integration. You're forcing inter, inter-hemispheric uh, coherence, which means left-right will work together. You are balancing all, all the waves of your brain, which is alpha, delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma. You're increasing theta as well, which is a healing wave. You're increasing gamma, which increases cre- creativity. So the, that, does, that give, does that answer your question or do you want more? Thank you. No, thank you. I mean, I, you're just such a treasure. Like, the, I don't like, I don't want to end the interview because I want to just keep asking you things because there's, there's, there's maybe the only person on the spitting earth who can answer these things the way that you do. But I want to finish with something that I find when I coach people holds them. And, and I think that maybe you can help me help other people and just help anybody listening to it. And this is this idea of cognitive dissonance. And I think Christian. what holds people back, and you can explain it differently than I can, but it's holding, you, you, know, you talked about coherence a minute ago, mm-hmm. getting both sides mm-hmm. of the brain working mm-hmm. together. It's another type of coherence, though, or incoherence or incongruency, where we hold two conflicting thoughts. For example, everybody, I want to be a multimillionaire, but there's this other part of you that thinks rich people get there by doing bad things. And so these are two mm-hmm. thoughts in conflict. And so... It's great to have a, 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 a positive thought. I have this cognitive dissonance issue, which she's holding up both trees if you're listening to the audio, the healthy one and the toxic one. Is there a, she's doing this, so this is the root of the, the basically we go to the, the, the root of your work, so to speak, root pun intended, right? Because of the trees. <laughs> is there, people aware be holding these two, thoughts, not just a positive and negative, but they are in conflict with one another, which is different. You can have a positive and a negative thought, but when two thoughts contradict one another, I think you're wired for pain potentially, and you're wired to sort of chase your tail, so to speak. So if someone's sitting here going, well, heck, that's me, like no question at all. Like I want to be in a loving relationship, but I don't think I deserve to be loved. Those are two thoughts in conflict with one another. What would you say lastly to somebody who not and even as I've said it, are starting to become aware of other conflicting thoughts they have. What would you say to somebody like that? First of all, that it's very normal. We all have it because we're all dealing with so much stuff. So it's very much because we can make choices and because there's so many options and there's that. That's why. So it's very normal. So just to, it's so important that we don't get frightened and and um get into guilt, shame and condemnation because we do every time we do something wrong because of unfortunately because of our 
neuroreductionistic world that we live in and quick fix world and like you know what's wrong with you if you haven't said enough gratitude statements or if you haven't in the religious yeah. world you know where's your faith and so there's a lot of toxic positivity in both the religious world and the psychological and the scientific world where yeah. you're supposed to be in this day and age so that leads to a lot of cognitive dissonance so first of all i want to normalize it which immediately people should be going phew i'm not the only one as soon as you do that you've already started shifting brain processes and brain health the other thing is that this is what we wired for so if i'm in cognitive dissonance and the one is saying you this is this and, the, and then the other one is saying the opposite then you have to use this to fix this you have to go through the neuro cycle you can it's going to take you 63 days but you don't ignore this you land your helicopter and you start doing the work and you start working out why is there this dissonance why is there this this cognitive dissonance where i'm thinking one thing but i'm doing another why no i should be doing that but i can't do that or i believe whatever anything that's in opposition um that because th this is the wise mind your cognitive dissonance is the wise mind and some kind of experience that has led to the growth of this thought that is impacting your behavior. So what we want to do is find out what, where does this come from and how can I reconceptualize it so that I can operate in this accurate truth. So mm -hmm. when you, yeah, so that's it. So you just, you got to do the work of the, it's not going to go away in five minutes. I would recommend landing the helicopter, do the neurocycle over the 63 days. I have to tell you the two things that I took from today because I have read the book and so I'm aware of the five steps and there's two things I took from today I just want to share with everybody. Well, three. One is that you're even more brilliant than I knew. <laughs> it's more incredible than I knew. But two things. One, I'm driving the helicopter. Yep. So, and so are you all. You're driving that helicopter so you can get above these things and look down at them and you can park the helicopter and do the work. And that's important to know because I think sometimes we think the helicopter drives us yes. and that's not the case. And, I, and then and then I think probably, you know, there's a lot of different things you shared today, but I think the second one for me is that I can get above these thoughts and that they can lose their power over me. I've always sort of known that to some extent, mm -hmm. but I don't think I understand the extent that you've said this today. And I just really want to thank you. I, I think today was one of the most remarkable conversations. I, 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 I know it's one of those people are going to have to go back and listen to again. Mm -hmm. Because of because of the depth of it, but I just think you're unbelievable. I want people following you. Should just start at Instagram. I mean, they should get your books, but should they go to Instagram to uh, to follow you there? Is that the best place? Probably? Yeah, go to Instagram, Dr. Caroline Leaf, because from there you can get to everything. And the book yeah. is at, doc, at cleaning up your the name of the book, cleaning up your mental mess .com. I've got a podcast, as you know, you've been on it, cleaning up your mental mess. But that's a great place. Instagram, the book, book cleaning up your mental mess .com. Guys, she's unbelievable. She's one of a kind. I'm just Aww. telling you, which is why I'm so grateful to have Cute. had a chance to uh, share this experience with all of you guys here today. So thank you, Caroline. And I can't wait to have you back again because this is this is easily one part of like a 10-part conversation. Aww. I know that for sure. So thank you so much. Might help if my video was on so you guys can see my face. <laughs> So I don't know about you guys, but um, I think I just wrote a whole book on the mind, the brain, thinking, thoughts, how to control your life. Um, so I'd, I'd be interested, Chad, what did you write down based on this conversation? I mean, I know we've, we've listened to Dr. Caroline Leaf quite a few times, and every time we listen to her, it, it's like I have another 15 pages that I wrote down. Man, so that was a lot. And um, definitely for me, by far, this this one is hitting at the right time. And it's pro it's definitely the best one. You know, that, I've, that and I've, I've said that a few times, but this for sure, for sure, for sure is the best one. And it's just a reminder to me that we don't know what we don't know until, you know, it's like Jim Rohn says, the, the book you don't read can't help. So I'm listening to this and I ordered three of her books. Cause I haven't read, I'm going to read this, the, the newest one first, but I'm just like, Oh my gosh. Like what I, what I came to understand just now is that we, you know, like with it works and stuff, we get really focused on health, you know, what supplements we can put into our body. But obviously what I'm convinced of now is that our mental health is just as important, if not more important, you know, because of everything I'm going through, um, you know, my wife's going through some, some major health issues. I'm going through some health ish, health stuff. And this is hitting at the right time because it's one thing to exercise, which we should all do. Go outside and get sun, you know, all the things, right? Have the right vitamins and take the right 
nutrition and all that kind of stuff. But if our mind, if we have those, those black forests growing and we're feeding the black forest and it's destroying the, the green healthy forest, it really doesn't matter. I mean, the nutrition, everything, it's just getting, it, just, it doesn't, it, it's part of the equation necessary. So to get into this though, I love how she's talking about, um, you know, first of all, you said, Joel, when your mind is right, you're unstoppable. So it's this, this thing of, is my mind right? I think that's a good question to ask first. And, and as they shared today, no one's mind is right. So what we all know right now is that we can take steps to take our mind into a healthier place. Just like if we're already going to the gym, we're already doing nutrition, we can always get healthier. We can have a better workout. We can eat better foods. We can bring in more. We can always get better. And so I think most people probably haven't even considered in, a, in, a, in the same way of being intentional about their mental health as they are about their physical health. So, and I'm, I'm excited to start this journey because I, you know, some of the things she said too, just like positive affirmations, those are good, but they wear off quickly <laughs> and they're just like a band. It's like putting a bandaid on it, you know, putting a bandaid on it. We need to get in and do the, the surgery and go deep and, and understand. So let me go into some of my points here. What is a thought, something you build? We're always thinking, feeling, choosing, thinking, feeling, choosing, thinking, feeling, choosing. And that process is leading ultimately to where we are now in our life, our results. And we are in charge of that. We get to think and feel and choose whatever we want. It's called free will, right? We get, we get to do that. So that was the first one. Um, our body literally tries to fight toxic thoughts. So when we have toxic thoughts, we are, we are using some of, our, some of our bandwidth of our immune system, of our body. And so if, if our body's fighting so much toxic thoughts, I can't imagine when a, when a disease or a sickness enters our body and we've got limited uh, tools to, to fight that physical sickness because we're using it all fighting mental sickness. And so, wow, um, we can identify toxic patterns when we self-regulate. So it's this intro looking inside ourselves and, and just doing a checkup from the neck up and really seeing, being honest. It's really all it is, is it's being honest. Where am I? What, what triggers me? What toxic thoughts do I have? What thoughts do I have there? What can I identify when I get in my helicopter and I'm flying across the forest and I go, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was there. What is that? And doing the deep dive and going, oh, okay, now I know what that is. You have to identify identifying it first. Um, you know, I, I wrote down the five five steps to mind management, but I'm not going to go into that. But the fact we can improve brain management by 81%, most people are probably at zero. <laughs> so we can improve by 81%, and we're going to improve everything about our body when we improve our mind. If the mind's messy, the body's messy. So I, I think even we can work out as much as we want. We can eat all the stuff we want. We can be so healthy and physical looking on the outside, but we can have chemical imbalances, hormones messed up, mind all over the place. That's why you'll find, you'll see people that look like they're in great physical shape and they're so depressed or they've got everything. From, from our view, we look and say they got everything and they're, they're suicidal or they kill themselves. And it's like, what the heck? If I looked like that, I wouldn't kill myself. If I had that bank account, I wouldn't kill myself. But it doesn't matter when the person's mind is... And then the other people, they're so happy with so little. Why is that? Because their mind is right. They have a correct, they have a healthy, healthy mindset. So it flows out of that. Um, mind has to be managed. Uh, you can lose up to 80% of nutrition because of mind. And I'll just go through a couple more here. Um, you know, the, the toxic thought trees, you know, and then the optimism, get to that part of the forest, fly over the forest of our mind to see what's there. It influences how we see ourselves. Um, black forest versus green forest, self-regulate. I love, I love all that. 1,400 neurophysical things are either helping you or hurting you. That's a lot. I want, the, I want as many of those to be helping me. I don't know about you. <laughs> For sure. Uh, I love, Christianity tells what? Science shows how? It's like in the Bible when they say take every thought captive. Okay. How do I do that? <laughs> Why do you take every, every thought captive? And, you know, Dr. Uh, Caroline Leaf in, in her books and things, she explains that. She, this process of, of how we can do that. Um, 
the breathing technique, that's something we can all take home right now. Breathing in for three seconds and thinking, saying the words, think, feel, think, feel, and then exhaling for seven seconds that when we're choosing. And that, I mean, I think how, how great would that be, Joel? Like when we're in our junk and we just want to react to just walk away and just do that for two minutes, change everything. Cause, cause there's that space between us being stimulus and reaction. And when, if we can take a pause, we'll, we'll make way better choices just, just by doing that one thing right there. And then the last thing I'll just say is I'm driving the helicopter and you're driving your helicopter. So we can become self-aware first of all, to know that we can get above these thoughts. And when we get above the thoughts, like Ed Milat said, they lose their power. And then, you know, we can go from saying they made me mad to I choose to be happy regardless of what the other person does to me. And we can literally get to that place where we have a healthy enough mindset where we can walk into a room and we can determine the atmosphere in the room regardless of what's happening in that room. So I, and I just think of the, the thermometer versus the thermostat. And in this business and in this kind of company, you have to be an influencer, which means you have to be careful about who's influencing you. And the better that you and I can get about walking in our own skin and knowing who we are, knowing whose we are and going in and, and just being confident and, and understanding these things. It's just when we get that mind healthy and our body healthy, man, we're unstoppable. So I think I went over my five minutes, but I, 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 I go back and watch this one again, Joel, and read those books. And I'm just excited to share this with as many people that'll listen. Yeah. And, and to reiterate what Chad said in like boiling it down to its basic form, you as a leader have the ability to be anticipatory versus responding to the things that happen. So when you're taking control of your mind and your thoughts, like Chad was saying, you have the ability to see things before they happen and choose the response versus things happening to you and you just instantly responding. Uh, that's so good. All right. So uh, we got Tay over here and I, I saw Tay nodding. I saw Tay's head down writing notes. I think he wrote a whole book uh, in this 45 minutes. So uh, let's see what Tay's got written down. Yeah, it was so good. I was kind of going back and forth from the one we did previous with her and uh, John Maxwell, because I was trying to just take notes, but I just really wanted to keep it simple because I think it's so much good. And it also just, for me, I, I think for me personally, there's two types of people. You know, there's the people that get to the top of the mountain and they shout down and tell you how to get there. But then there's people who get to the mountain, top of the mountain and they throw a rope down and show you like the actual steps and like teaches you how to get there uh, physically. And for her, I think she's one of those people that when you talk about the mind, I think a lot of people tell you things to do, but she's actually showing us how to actually change our mind. So uh, I love that. And I love uh, when I first thing I wrote down is like, if your mind is not right, then your life's probably not right. And I think about me and just kind of trying to uh, fit this into like my story and my situation. I thought about something my wife said to me a couple of weeks back. She said, uh, nothing seems to bother you. Like with everything the kids do, like you, you don't seem to get upset. You don't seem to do nothing. And I was like, I spend a lot of time with Jesus. Like there's a reason I get up and pray is the first thing that I do. It's the reason I don't do just a devotional in the morning. I do it throughout the day because I understand like if my mind isn't right, then I'm probably like she say, like think, feel, choose. If I'm not thinking the right things, then I'm probably going to feel anxious. I'm going to feel stressed. I'm going to feel like they're doing everything to get on my nerves and I'm going to react according to that. But since I'm doing the things being proactive and doing things that make me more patient, make me more gentle, more kind towards them. Then like, when she say like, I choose, like I feel like I'm not, I feel at peace with things. So when they do things, I, rem I remind myself, they're kids, that's what kids do. And I tell it all the time, like, that's what kids do. So we have to expect them to do that and allow them to actually work things up. So for me, instead of being uh, reactionary, like I started to be proactive, like, okay, you guys figure out how to settle this thing. So for me, it's, uh, it kind of just made me kind of see it in a, in a different light, which is good being a parent with uh, these young kids. So that was awesome. Uh, the second thing that uh, Ed kind of mentioned, he said, past thought informs future thought. And I love that. And the key word for me was informs. Uh, when he said informs, for me, that's like bringing to your attention. Like we do something, it's almost like you're saying, okay, you've done this before, this is what happened. And I think for me, when I mentioned the devotions, I mean, personal development, that's why it is so key. 
because you're changing your mind. You're seeing things from a different uh, uh, perspective. You're reading books from people who've already been somewhere and done something that giving you that key. So when he says inform, you have to inform yourself like you experienced this and this is what happened. Somebody else wrote a book about they did the same thing, maybe something similar, and this is what happened for them. Okay, don't try what you tried to do. Like, don't fall down, get back up and do the same thing. Like fall down, get up, learn the lesson, see what somebody else did and switch it up, move forward, fall down in a different space. So for me, it's almost understanding like you have to continue to inform yourself. Like she said, your mind is always with you. And you like, you have to manage your mind. And I love when she said, that's why I went back to the John Maxwell that I wanted to uh, point out. She said, the mind is changeable, but you have to be open and you have to be willing. And I think many people struggle because they aren't willing. They're so stuck in their ways and doing things how they've always done it. And I think that's why most people continue to get the results that they always got. So that really stuck out to me. Uh, the third thing uh, she talked about was self-regulate. I love that. She said, you're not gonna be perfect. So for me, it's like, don't aim for progress, uh, perfection aim to be more efficient the example with my kids i'm not going to be the perfect dad i'm still going to have moments where i may get upset more i may do this but i know how to like i'm more aware of the situations i understand like if i'm feeling stressed if i'm feeling a certain type of way then i understand my mind probably isn't right so for me it's like i go and check my day what did you do today to actually feed your mind did you pray today did you do your devotional did you spend time just having a, a conversation with your kids did you talk about these things so just being more uh more aware so that you can regulate your mind and, and kind of move in the direction that you want to go and then this is the last thing that i want to share and i just do it this is literally blew my entire mind when she said this. she said uh put your thoughts on trial and I was like oh my gosh like that is that is probably my word of year like I don't need to do this every single day she said ask answer and discuss and I love that because me and Carrie do this all the time without knowing we was actually doing that and we tell ourselves like don't talk about the problem talk about the root of the problem don't stay on the surface because you stay on the surface like she said that's putting a band-aid on it it's gonna happen again once you take the band-aid off you're probably gonna scratch that wound and you're gonna start back bleeding actually get to the root of it i love what she says ask answer and discuss okay why did this happen why does this keep coming to back up now talk about it and i think when you talk about it that's when you have these aha moments that's when you have these like literally life-changing moments where you can pivot and you can address these issues in a way that allows you to heal in a way that you know you're not going to repeat these same things because you already addressed that issue so that right there for me when she said that that was like oh that's i haven't heard her say that that is the one thing that i'm going to stick with today so for me it was like put your thoughts on trial a lot of people i think we struggle with that because we don't want to dig back into the issues that little as kids that really hurt us and i think many times the only way to to actually heal is to deal with those things. I heard this quote one time, it says, what you run from actually stays with you the longest because it's chasing after you because you don't want to deal with it. So for me, understand like, if I want to move forward into the future that God has promised me, then I probably have to dig back into my past and talk about some of these things that want to keep me hostage, that want to hold me captive so that I don't feel like I'm worthy and I'm deserving of everything that God has promised. So uh, just so much good in this today. And I just love how Ed just kind of take these things and he just kind of breaks it down and puts it in a way that we can understand it and digest it in a way that we can really use these as tools to really change our lives. So, so good. And I'm glad you actually, we talked about this last time, Joe, and I was like, I need to get a head start so I can kind of prepare myself so I'm not like a mental mess on here. So I just thank you for sharing this one and just so much good. And thank you for sharing as well, Chad, because I think it's so much good in everything that you always bring too, man. So thank you guys. So good. Uh, Tay, that was amazing. Uh, and that's, that's one of the great things about this. And, and guys, First of all, we just want to make sure that we help you live your possibilities. And one of the best ways that we can do that is to bring awareness to mental health. You know, that's one of the things that she is so passionate about because what she said was, um, we're, we have a huge rise in the mismanagement of mental health. What they're doing is they're saying, yes, you have it, but then they're not going to the root cause of it. They're not talking about it. They're just prescribing something for it. So what they're saying is, hey, guys, we understand that there's an issue. And like Chad and Tay both said, here, let's just put a Band-Aid on it. And when you have an entire world full of Band-Aids, 
man, it's no wonder why everybody is so sensitive when it comes to any topic right now, because it feels like every time a topic comes up, it's somebody's ripping a bandaid off. And if you've ever ripped a bandaid off before, it's not fun. So what she was saying was less than 3% of leaders and thought leaders are even talking about mental health. So it's something that, you know, I know myself, Chad and Tay, we've talked about. It's something that we want to bring up constantly because of the fact that when you are healthy mentally, you're going to have a healthy life. You're going to have uh, healthy conversations. You're going to put things out there that are completely different than like she said, if you have a mental mess. So the first thing that she was talking about, obviously that just blew my mind and, and Chad touched on it was the fact that your body fights chemically the exact same way with a negative thought as it does whether you have a virus or a disease. So your body naturally and chemically knows that your thoughts are powerful so that it fights the negative thoughts when you have them. Talking about self-regulating, which is, which is huge, and hopefully this is something that you take away from today, is that you can kind of step outside of your thinking and your thoughts and look at them and dissect them. And like Tay said, have conversations about them, reflect on them and learn how to change and handle them. Because if you learn to self-regulate yourself, it allows you to learn how to direct your life into the life that you want to live. Now, I know we, we've gone through a couple different mindset ones based on, on this thought process and, and you know, talking about unpacking your past. You know, when you can look at your past and the bad things that happened, without emotion and knowing that they happened, there was no other way that it could have happened because it did happen. And how you react now based on that allows you to move forward. So you can really go back through and change your past by looking at your past through a completely different lens. When you look through your past through a negative lens, it's going to create a negative future. When you look at your past through a positive, even though bad things may have happened, it made you who you are today. It gives you a story to tell that could help somebody else. And you look at it from a positive, it will only help create a positive outcome and a positive future. You have to step outside and know that you're going to have issues. Because once you know that you have those, it's so much easier because the next thing you have to do is figure out how to manage it. So it kind of like when we're talking about successful people, successful people know that there's going to be problems and they're ready for them. They're not surprised by them. So if you know you're going to have issues in life, then the only other question is, is how are you going to handle those and manage them when they come up? The thought process and the facts on nutrition blew my mind. That was something that I wrote down. When you have negative thoughts and a negative mindset and you're consuming healthy, clean, nutritious, dense food, your body is losing 80% of the nutrients that you're consuming because it doesn't know how to assimilate it because all you're doing is think. It's, it's almost like when you're thinking negative and you're eating positively, it's as if you're still eating junk food because of the fact that your mind is junk. So it's not consuming the healthy stuff. Being positive and eating healthy will also allow it to supercharge your body and supercharge your health. She says, gather awareness to your thoughts and they will have less power over you. If you're constantly being ran by your thoughts, it's time to step outside so that you're aware of it. Because once you're aware of it, you can confront it. And once you can confront it, you can start to control it instead of allowing it to control you. The how to of the story is what's important. You know, the two sides of the coin of spirituality and science. Spirituality is the story, the science is the how-to. Guys, the story is what gathers people in. Your story is what's going to bring people along with you. Now, learning the science and the steps to how-to will allow them to follow along in your footsteps with their story, because the how-to can be applied to any story. But as you know, you were created by one specific purpose. You are the only one of you out there. That is your superpower. Your superpower is God only created one of you. He created you for specific purpose. 
So your story is completely different than anybody else's and it's going to impact thousands of lives when you learn to use that story for impact. But the how-to can be applied to everybody's story. So like we talk about with the steps to success, with your daily tasks lists, you know, with going through your charts to promoting, all of the science and the systems and the how-to are the same for everybody. But the story your story is what's impactful and what has the ability to change other people's lives and give other people inspiration. Talking about brain healing, guys, that brain prep breathing of breathing in for three seconds, saying think and feel, and then breathing out for seven, saying choose. Do that today and see what a difference it makes. Do that for, like she said, 30 to 60 seconds and see what it does for your mental clarity, your mental focus. Uh, they talked about cognitive dissonance. Within this business, we know a lot of it has to do with money because people want to come in and they want to create wealth. They want to do all the great things, but maybe they were br brought up knowing money is the root of all evil. You know, So all of a sudden you have a goal, but then you have a thought that counteracts that goal. What we want to do is help you reconcile the two of them together so that when you have a positive thought, it overcomes that negative thought. When you have a new truth, when you know that it's not money, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. You know, God can use you and money to accomplish great things. When all of a sudden you have that change in mindset on something, it allows you to overcome the negative thought, which allows you to go to that next level in your life. Finally, I wanted to talk about this, the you can get above your thoughts and then choose the ones that help produce the life that you want. The whole reason behind all of this is now that you have the awareness, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to go back into the patterns of having bad thoughts and letting the bad thoughts control your actions, which ultimately comes to the outcome of what the life is that you have? Or are you going to, like the Bible says, choose to take those thoughts captive orient them, look for the positive and create the positive life that you've always wanted. The power is within your grasps. It's within your ability to make the right decisions. And we hopefully use this specific training from Dr. Caroline Leaf and Ed Milet, this conversation to catapult you into ways of thinking that you never thought before. And as important as mental health is, guys, please take a moment and share this with somebody that you know could benefit for learning this new information. You could unlock the doors to a whole new life for somebody just by sharing this information with them like we shared it with you. So go out, make it an amazing day, choose the best thoughts and apply them to your life so that you can go out and change the lives of others, guys. We'll see you again here next time.